So let's begin. So first of all, thank you everybody for joining us and a big thank you to our panelists for volunteering their time today. Uh, my name's Josh, I'm from Little Phil and we're one of the key sponsors of this year's State of the Sector Research. And uh, sorry, one second. Again. Just going to get the presentation up. And can you see that? Okay. No. Of course, we have some technical difficulties for a technical presentation. <laughs> um, it's always, always going to be the way. So for those who've just entered, um, we're, we're going to run through the state of the sector. We'll then have our panel. Uh, any questions that you may have, please drop it into the chat and then uh, we'll have our panel answer those towards the end of the call. Alrighty, over to you, Josh. Yep, I'm just getting... Okay, we'll have to use a mouse today. So once again, thank you very much for everybody who participated in this year's survey uh, and for those that are joining us and obviously for our expert panelists for volunteering their time. My name is Josh. Today, we're going to be joined by uh, Professor David Gilchrist from the University of WA, Nigel Harris, uh, who is an expert leader uh, with a vast wealth of experience from the nonprofit, specifically health foundation sector, and then Charlotte Sangster, who is a current nonprofit CEO at a health charity. So, just a little bit more on myself. Uh, I've worked in the sector for coming up to seven years now. I'm the co-founder of Little Phil. Our goal has always been to use technology and emerging technologies to help nonprofits lower overheads, increase trust and transparency, engagement, and open up new streams of fundraising. Professor David Gilchrist is the director at the Center for Public Value at the University of WA. David has a career spanning over 30 years uh, and has held a number of senior roles in the not-for-profit commercial and public sectors. Uh, most recently, David has held the role of Assistant Auditor General at the in Western Australia, sorry. And he's also taught accounting and finance at the London School of Economics and Portsmouth University in the UK, uh, as well as at Curtin University and Edith Cowan University in Australia. now that wants to work <laughs> and as mentioned before so nigel harris uh nigel has a career spanning over 40 years nigel is one of australia's most experienced and successful health foundation ceos uh i'll allow all the panelists to dive a bit more into their background after this but i believe nigel was at the martyr foundation which has done some fantastic work uh and currently he's a respected advisor to organizational leaders fundraising executives and donors Charlotte Sangster is a is the CEO of Muscular Dystrophy New South Wales and an executive committee member of the Muscular Dystrophy Foundation of Australia. Uh, Charlotte has, from my conversations with Charlotte, is a very impressive up and coming CEO who's really embracing digital technologies. So we're very excited and glad to have all these panelists involved today. So the research that we conducted for the state of the sector for 2023 builds upon our research from 2020 uh, for state of the sector, but specifically around the impacts of COVID-19 on nonprofit fundraising. Back in 2020, when we conducted our research, we were really looking at how or what effects COVID-19 was having on nonprofit organizations specifically with the almost overnight closure of in-person fundraising events, uh, the changes to program deliveries of, of aid and so on, and then obviously uh, the transition to work from home for, for many organisations. This year's research, building upon that, we've looked to quantify or qualify those 
uh, expectations that nonprofits were having back in 2020, as well as diving deeper into digital capabilities, cybersecurity, with all of the, the recent kind of cybersecurity breaches with Optus, uh, Medibank and the likes, the nonprofit sector is not immune to these. So the research itself, uh, it was conducted over a five month period with over 20,000 ACNC registered organizations invited to participate. Uh, we closed out the research with 830 total participants via online surveys. The breakdown between DGR and non-DGR registered organizations was fairly split. So 39% and 61% respectively. And then for those of you who are not familiar with the sector itself, uh, here's a high level overview. So the nonprofit sector employs roughly 10 and a half percent of the Australian population or the Australian working population. Uh, it generates around 10% of Australia's GDP. We have roughly 3.2 million volunteers, which data is showing that that's a decline from 2018. So roughly 200,000 and Currently, the industry receives around $13.4 billion worth of donations. It should also be noted that not only is there ACNC registered nonprofits, which the estimates are around 60,000, but we also have other nonprofits and unregistered nonprofits and so on with the estimates of around 600,000. So this research was really focused just on ACNC registered nonprofits. And as I touched on at the start of why we, or the focus of this year's research, digital competency across the board for nonprofits seems to be uh, showing that they're better across the board compared to those with low or medium competency. So from program delivery through to fundraising revenue, those organizations that have a higher degree of digital competency seem to be performing better. And then also looking at uh, the transition from uh, cash payments and check to digital payments. So here's a, a, a nice kind of visualization of that data of the transition from cash payments in 2007 to 2019. And as you can see, the number of and the value of cash transactions has more than halved. Um, we anticipate that after COVID, so this, this data is up until 2019. So after COVID, we think that that's probably trend, that's accelerated a lot. And then it'd be good to note that Australia is actually phasing out checks by 2030. So moving into some of the key results of or our findings, overall, we received reports of declines in fundraising. Um, COVID-19 negatively, on the whole, negatively affected fundraising. Um, cybersecurity definitely poses a threat with many organizations having no or very little cybersecurity training. Um, and partnerships with companies seems to still be lacking in Australia uh, for company giving and so on. Uh, digital competency across the board needs to improve and Still currently compared to the US, ex accepting cryptocurrency donations seems to be very low in Australia. If we look at our stats around the decline in fundraising, we had two out of three participants reporting a decline in fundraising over the 2021 to 2022 financial year. It should also be noted, as you can see from the graph that we did still have some organizations who uh, reported increases, not to the degree of the, or the impact of the decreases, but it's still a, a data point that we should be looking at. This graph is obviously broken down into DGR and non-DGR. Um, so non-DGR seems to have 
had more of the increase up to the 19% bracket and so on. Digital competency. So the aim of this question for survey participants was really to gauge how organizations and responsible persons felt about their organization's digital competency. I think so. Um, not to go to the GP. Um, but that can't, the GP could be oh, sorry. Friday. Um, yeah. has looked at and everybody is oozing a little bit of liquid. They've got some, when when he's had big pressure, pressure issues in the past, so the chain would come and they put. Oh, there we go. Uh, so, yeah, was a digital competency. So, across the board, 31% of nonprofits have reported that they need to improve their digital competency whilst 57% reported that they would have an average digital competency. Interestingly, non-DGRs believe they need to improve their digital competency more than DGR organisations. So with 17% more uh, reporting that. Moving into cybersecurity and data privacy. So four out of five organizations reported that they've had no recent cybersecurity training in the last 12 months. This is really important because I think we've seen recently with, um, I think it was the Pareto data breach. So the telefundraising uh, company in Brisbane, nonprofits, despite them doing good work and being for the community, they're not immune to hackers and they're not immune to um, cybersecurity threats. So this is a highly critical area that needs to have a, a lot of um, thought and training and assistance provided for the industry. DGR registered nonprofits do seem to have more training than non-DGR. So there's a discrepancy between, and, and this is potentially from budgeting or resources point of views, but there's a discrepancy between DGRs and non-DGRs having any kind of cybersecurity training. Um, another interesting piece from the research though, is that two thirds of nonprofits are not concerned about their remote workforces, potential for cybersecurity problems and data privacy issues. So if we imagine that most organizations now will have a work from home or a, at least a partial work from home policy where employees or volunteers may be using their own devices or company devices, connecting to unsecure Wi-Fi, doing a vast array of different uh, potential cybersecurity uh, vulnerability issues with the way that they conduct work. It shows that um, there is probably a lack of understanding or awareness on these potential issues for organization leaders. We also asked around the handling and compliance of data and privacy for organizations. So the Australian government after the Optus and Medibank data breaches has brought out much tougher regulations for responsible persons uh, if they're found to not be uh, handling or adequately protecting data. So those laws and regulations can actually result in fines of up to $50 million for the responsible persons if they're found to have not acted in a responsible manner. Um, we see this as a massive threat to boards or board composition. So if we imagine that there are many board members who come from a professional background, uh, they may not be aware that they personally could be liable if their organizations that they're on the board of are not complying with regulations. So this is a highly concerning area uh, and more so for the reason that 41% of nonprofits are unsure how or whether or not they comply with any data privacy regulations. Um, we did have 25% say that they store no data. So in a day where you're operating or running a nonprofit, 
uh, it, it's a little bit concerning if you're not understanding that you will have data somewhere, whether that's paper, whether that's you know direct debit forms or uh, service uh, recipient forms, there has to be some kind of data in your organization somehow. Are you handling it compliantly or not? So we've gotten through our key findings really quickly, which is great. Um, there will be a link to the full report later, but we wanted to really focus on providing the opportunity for our panelists to give their expertise on, on some of these findings and then open the floor to uh, our participants or our, our attendees so that they can ask any burning questions. So I think kicking off, if any of our panelists now have anything they'd like to add on the findings or thoughts, first of all, happy to open up the, the panel to that and then we can move into the first panel question. David, did you have anything you'd like to add on any of the specific key findings or? Certainly, Josh, I was being a, a gentleman to let others <laughs> uh, jump in, but um, look, there's so much uh, interesting stuff uh, in this report. And I'd like to say, first and foremost, well done for uh, developing it and getting it out. I think that the answer to this particular question, uh, data, is it an asset or a liability? Data is definitely an asset, but it's something that we lack greatly across the human services sector particularly, but also across the charitable and not-for-profit sector. Uh, so I applaud you for undertaking this study. I think it's really important. I think the second thing that's important is that um, we need to have an industry plan that allows us to develop this data asset that is needed in order to understand what's going on. And I think some of the discussion around things like applying market um, uh, rhetoric or market values to our descriptions of the way funding and businesses operate in these areas is making it very difficult for us to actually appreciate how governments, uh, the sector, philanthropists and everybody needs to get on board in order to be able to pull together a what I would call a logical industry plan for this sector going forward into, into coming decades, because there's no doubt that things are getting a lot more costly in this sector, uh, but there's also, of course, a resource crunch now, uh, but that crunch is only going to become more solid and more significant in time to come, I think. It's great input. I, I would agree. Uh, not, Nigel, did you have anything, or Charlotte? Whoever would like to? Jump in, Charlotte. I'll follow on if you've got a comment there. Oh, look, I think for, from my perspective, yes, data is absolutely an asset, but um, when does it become a liability? I know I've been reflecting lately on your data is only as good as, you know, the quality of it. And is there a point at which, you know, you're keeping, you're storing too much data and you should be looking at archiving and and potentially getting rid of it. And I think that that's probably an area in not-for-profits where we have a tendency to not want to let go of any of our data. And we, even if it's potentially not very useful, and I know that, um, you know, there are, there are certain guidelines around what data you should be keeping and what data you should be getting rid of once you, it's served its purpose. So a bit of a comment, I suppose, and perhaps a question around how do we make sure that we're educating the sector around the difference between an asset data <laughs> and a liability? Very good point. I, I think we we kind of agree from our perspective. We take the, the Peter Parker or the Spider-Man approach of great power with the data, but also a great responsibility. Yeah. And I perhaps the sector's lacking in that responsibility part. Um, Nigel? Yeah, look, I certainly fall on the, uh, the asset side. I think the question for me really, or questions really come around how we understand and use the data that we have, and then how we resource that, that usage as well, which I think are probably some of the critical questions for a host of nonprofit uh, organisations, charities. I think the usage question can sometimes turn the asset to a liability if we don't uh, attend to that completely. And you know, an example of that might be, particularly when we're looking at data relating to 
fundraising into donors and supporters, it's easy and perhaps a little too tempting to see data as data rather than it being information relevant to people and preferences and the way in which they engage with your organisation that serves a purpose. So I think that I would just observe a caution here that we continue to really drill into this question of uh, why the data and how the data and what we use it for and what lies behind it and where it's purposed. So we see it as a conduit, not a, an absolute. Yeah, great, great input. Has, do you know if any of the organisations, anyone's involved in, have they got policies around GDPR? Do they know what GDPR is? Um, I, I think this is, Josh, if I can jump in on that, I think this is a, a really important discussion. And um, Charlotte and Nigel's comments uh, really resonate greatly for me, um, having been in practice for 30 years around this. But I think there's two things that we really need to consider. One is the industry level data. And for instance, how do we arrive at pricing? So for instance, um, things like NDIS pricing is not based on the cost of service delivery, based on how much money is available. It's a recipe for instability, unsustainability in the sector. And so my concern is always with that industry level data and that industry knowledge that really needs to be deeply understood by government policymakers, by philanthropists, so that they can contribute both their knowledge as well as their resources, and also by the sector. And I think going back to your question in relation to GDP and other measurement capacities, um, I think this is an area, to be frank, where the sector hasn't really got deep understanding. And it's logical that it shouldn't have. It comes from a whole different perspective and different skills base. Uh, but we do need to get that deep economic understanding so that, for instance, in relation to data, we don't have an ABS data, non-profit data collection strategy. We don't have the ABS looking at this sector and reporting on this sector, and yet we do with sectors that are worth much less than the charitable sector in Australia, you know, the second biggest employer in the country. So I think there's a real need uh, for us to think at an industry level for this and a real need for the sector to come to grips with not just data, but also the economics of the sector itself, which is vastly different to the economics of commerce and government. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I, I think, so, sorry, just to clarify, I didn't say GDP, I said GDPR. So yeah. the, the legislation out of Europe around data and yeah. the right to right to remove or delete your data and so on. Yeah. Um, but I agree, with, I agree with your input too. Sorry, Josh, I just was going to make a few comments on the back of David's observations and just really to support that. I think firstly, um, you know, picking up this question of sector data and particularly around pricing, the, you know, the true cost of service provision, which I think is certainly one of the challenges around uh, um, dealing with funding models is a critical issue that you know, I, I don't know to the extent to which that is fully realised and understood, but you know, when we look at pro, uh, campaigns like the Pay What It Takes campaign that uh, certainly from Australia have been uh, advocating, and, and rightly so, um, in order to understand what your cost base is in providing services and, in fact, what your cost in generating funding might be, and the leveraging of data becomes critical. Uh, I don't know the extent to which... Um, the GDPR, and I see someone's looking to explain the acronym, so I'll leave that one to you, Josh. Uh, the Greater Data Privacy Regulation, I think, is right. Is that right? Is that, uh, is that close to the description? Yeah. An observation I would make across the sector, and this is horribly general and perhaps you know, terribly unfair to some, but the challenge to which leadership at governance and executive level, level really lean in to ask themselves some of the sharp questions that take them beyond the assumptions around which they see the work that they have responsibility for, I think is a really present question. So I think there's a, a challenge there. Am I asking the right questions? Am I asking the right way? Am I, am I pushing past my assumptions is important as well. The other quick just comment I wanted to make in relation to data, particularly sector-based data, is around data, particularly related to fundraising, by benchmarking data, I think we have to be really, really, really careful here 
because you know I hear conversations for decades now around things like cost of fundraising, assuming that you can somehow find a number that actually represents a cost base. And David, I, you may recall this, but you and I were at a seminar about six or seven years ago that uh, was hosted by the ACPNS where we tried to prosecute this question and uh, as a collective group failed dismally to get to any consensus. So I think if, uh, if that was so for that group, then I think there is no hope sectorally because there are so many variables. So even understanding what that interpretation of sector data is, is terribly important. And again, this is a leadership question um, because I hear so many folk actually assuming you can actually land on a particular number and that I think is dangerous in terms of engagement and service provision. Sorry, long answer there, but I just really see those questions as critical. Great, great, great input. Um, I think that kind of leads into our next question for yeah, the sorry, panel. Sorry. Just, just before we flick on, there, there are a few questions that relate to, to data specifically that, that might be worth commenting. Yep, sure. So, uh, so from the questions panel, uh, one one was just to explain the acronyms, which is fair enough. They can there's a lot of them these days. Uh, the other one was when considering data, and I'll read this verbatim. When considering data, uh, when working in the science space, the use of the Creative Commons on open platforms has been a sound approach. I think the approach is dependent on the type of data uh, when we are speaking around data. Uh, in the citizen science space, data is essential, but also open and shared. Um, I don't know if anyone has comment to that. Yeah, certainly I think that um, data, you know, we, we have a tendency to talk in very big uh, concepts and we talk about data as if data is all the same and, and it's homogenous. Um, and we've already had great comments from Nigel um, and, um, and indeed some written comments in relation to the quality of data. I think at the end of the day, um, we need to be more astute in terms of understanding why we collect data, what the use of that data is, how we understand it to be of a high quality or otherwise, and then how we store and, and, um, and I guess communicate the outcomes from that. Um, so different types of data have different solutions in regard to those questions. And I think we have to be um, more um, um, uh, focused on being able to say what data it is we're collecting, what we need it for, and how we're going to result or, or respond to those questions in relation to its use. I, I think on top of, so from the type of data as well, obviously there would be some data that is non-sensitive. So yeah. depending on the type of data, um, I think I know the organisation, um, if it's Maggie, uh, if it's not sensitive, so if you're collecting, I guess, data that you're happy to be shared around openly, it's probably less of a security risk or a concern as well. Um, yeah. Whereas, you know, if you're collecting personal health data or recipient data for services and aid or whether it's uh, donor data, payment details data, all of those kinds of data, I would say, are on a much higher scale of you need to understand and protect that uh, to a higher degree of, of security. Yeah. Um, I, I think right? too, just with that, I'll, I'll make a, a further comment too, that um, data such as financial data, for instance, um, is also, it, we're also in a position to make the charitable and non-profit sector a national um, case study and a national exemplar in relation to combining this kind of industry aggregate data, because we have, of course, the Australian Centre for Non-Profit and Philanthropy Studies um, uh, National Standard Chart of Accounts. So we've already got a standard chart of accounts. That chart of accounts, as I understand, it's been adopted by all of the governments in Australia, notwithstanding it hasn't necessarily been implemented as thoroughly as we can. But I guess what I'm saying there too is that we shouldn't be too negative on this because we've already got significant and really important infrastructure in place that can actually allow the charity sector to be the exemplar for industry reporting as opposed to, um, you know, always uh, following on, so to speak, in terms of what commerce and, and government might do. And just jump in there, David, to endorse mm. that. I think that my observation is that uh, you know, so much of this remains undiscovered. And as I'm just replying to a comment from Wendy Stoke, who's just retired from that leadership role at ACPNS, you know, I yeah. think that uh, 
uh, yeah, my challenge to leadership is really turn their minds to what is out there in the sector. You know, I know Miles has been championing this for decades again, and I suspect sometimes we get far less traction than we should simply because we don't know. So uh, you know, there's terrific work out there, um, basically PNS, Lord Stewardship, and other mm -hmm. institutions who just really need to turn our minds to that. Yeah. I think Excellent. That's there's also mind. there's also uh, just a comment from Wendy Scaife as well uh, from David's original comment around the uh, the big endorsement on the industry plan. Thinking David, long overdue. Uh, it's taken us way too long to prioritize acting more as a sector. Uh, we have more collective thinking and action uh, that we did, but how, how do we make the, the hero of the dish in TV parlance? <laughs> how do we make this the, the hero of the dish? I'll answer the, the acronym one. So general data protection regulation is out of Europe, but that expands basically globally for any EU citizen and the right for them to remove or delete their data. Excellent. Now, uh, I think we can probably move on to the next panel discussion question. So, yeah. yep. So who is responsible for the digital transformation organizations? So really here, you know, thinking, you know, is it leadership executives? Is it consultants? Is it the government? Is it the board? You know, where, where should this be coming from? And happy to go in. That's a, yeah, that's a typical question, isn't it? Because, I mean, one could say if we're talking about not-for-profits and charities, um, it's pretty well known that we lack resources in many areas, um, not for lack of trying, of course. Yep. Um, but there is, I mean, for example, um, during COVID, there was some funding that we were provided to support us with this, um, to look at our CRM and, you know, the way that we were operating digitally. And that was really, really helpful. However, it did get, get us in a situation where we had money for to invest in tech, but we didn't have the internal expertise or resources to, to manage such a significant project. So I think the, there's a holistic <laughs> view that needs to be taken to this or digital transformation. And it does start with not only the money, but also the resourcing internally and externally, because it takes a lot of a lot of time. If, if anyone's done a CRM <laughs> implementation, I'm sorry if I'm giving you flashbacks right now, but it is it's a nightmare and it's so much bigger than you can ever expect it to be. So, um, yeah, it takes more than just throwing a little bit of money at the problem is, is what I think my point might be. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I'd agree with that. And I guess um, going back to the industry plan, to me, this is a 10 to 15 year project, not a, a six month funding project. Yeah. And I think there's not just the resourcing issues that we're aware of. There is, as Charlotte's just eloquently outlined, skills deficits in relation to being able to both identify what's needed and then to be able to implement what's needed and then to be able to run what's needed is also a major issue, um, not just in terms of software, but also in terms of the desktop fleet in the sector. It's the oldest fleet in the economy. I think the other aspect is, though, that we've got to recognise the pricing issues around this because... The business rules are changing around IT and I've seen organisations that used to go to the local lotteries outfit to get a grant to buy software who are now paying subscriptions of a quarter of a million dollars a year to be able to, to um, undertake their work. But also the um, decades of starvation funding for human services, particularly in my experience, has meant that these organisations don't have any reserves or balance sheet capacity to be able to rectify this problem. And therefore, to me, I think this is a national, a really important national pro problem that governments and the sector, philanthropists, commerce, all have to get together as part of this industry plan to be able to actually understand what the problem is and to develop a 10 or 15 year plan to, to dig ourselves out of the hole. Because it will take that long, I think, to be able to get it to where we need it to be. Yeah, 
just to jump in and endorse uh, David and Charlotte's com comments, and particularly just that last point in terms of the national longitudinal approach. And I think the drums are beating for louder and louder in terms of a, a greater urgency around some collective response. And I see some of the comments that come out of um, the comparisons between, say, small business support and uh, non-profit support, and you know, I've seen some of uh, David Crosby's comments from CTO at the moment in that regard. But just to make the observation around who's responsible, my view is that this is where governance and management really need to be a lockstep. And yes, management will take responsibility for the execution of transformation work, but governance really has to understand what's at play, what needs to be resourced, and how that's progressed over time as well. And I think that you know, I've seen again, uh, slightly both the best and the worst of that in terms of uh, leaning in. So I think that it is a, a really strong message to boards to understand this deeply and an equally strong message for organisational management to um, you know, bring their A game to this question. Yeah, yeah, you have to you have to invest in this stuff. You just can't like stick your head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. No, and because when your and, name's and, on that top of that data breach uh, newspaper article, yeah. you yeah, you'll certainly regret sticking your head in the sand. Then, I, look, I think that that's right, and I think it does go back to pricing because we need training money to be able to train people, but also, I think uh, building on Nigel's comment, there needs to be. And acceptance within the sector as well. And I suspect, I, I sense that there's a, a pushback on this, but boards need to invest in themselves. And I think this is a major deficiency that we see, not simply because people don't feel that they shouldn't spend money on directors, volunteer directors, but also because, of course, they don't necessarily have the resources. But I think that's also a really critical aspect of this, being able to build the capacity of our directorship across the sector. Would you say that um, in your experience, you've seen boards who would act differently between being on a board of a non-profit compared to being on the board of a commercial company or, or listed? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I, I hear, uh, so my personal view is having been um, chair and a director for about 30 years in both commerce and the not-for-profit sector, the not-for-profit sector is actually the hardest sector to be a director in because it's you're balancing two priorities. One is might be financial sustainability, but the other, of course, is the more important mission or purpose of the organisation. And commercial organisations don't have this, and they, they certainly don't enact it. I mean, we've seen the Banking Royal Commission, for instance, as being a, a, a great example. I think at the end of the day, um, there is an expectation that this is not as important. And I think this comes back to my original comment uh, around understanding the economics and how important it is for the sector to execute an advocacy argument around the economic contribution of this sector. It's enormous, absolutely enormous. It's the second biggest employer in Australia. It is phenomenal how much all of that money that is collected from philanthropy, that's paid by taxpayers through grants, funding, et cetera, all goes back into the economy. It doesn't go to, um, you know, island nations where uh, people buy islands or into second houses or anything like that. And so I do think there's a fundamental need for us to understand those economics and to understand also the critical importance of this sector and how directorship is one of the most fundamental um, skill sets that we need to be able to make sure this sector is sustainable and continues to contribute the way it has. Again, just to jump in and agree with David, I think we get, we collected very general comment here, but we can become far too focused on the short term financials and forget that there are longitudinal economic factors and social factors at play here as well. So those economics leading to the service of social purpose. So both are far, far bigger issues than attending or hovering around a PL and making a whole lot of assumptions about what you think is happening, which is generally misinformed and misleading. So I think that you know, a couple of sharp comments there, but it really does mean that directors have to push aside their assumptions and actually think more broadly about what their role is. Spot on. And, and what do you think is going to be that catalyst to push the directors to, to change? I mean, terrible will happen, of course. <laughs> 
<laughs> at which point we all sort of duck for cover and uh, think the sky's falling because something bad has happened. But you're right, Charlotte, sometimes it does need a bit of a rude awakening to get everyone's attention and focus. So. Yeah. I'd just like to add a comment from Carly. Uh, she says, thank you, David. Uh, how do we advocate about this? Do we, do we have resources to share? Which I, I do believe we have resources after this, but there might be something you could direct her on there. Um, look, one of the, the primary audiences for this, of course, is the um, uh, the Minister for the ACNC or the Assistant Treasurer has set up the um, a, a process that's allowing a, a, the sector to put together an, uh, a, essentially a, a vision of what the sector needs to look like in coming years. Um, and I think so through the Department of um, Social Services, uh, there's an opportunity for the sector to really advocate that that should be a substantial document. I think we're in a, a really unique position where we have a minister that is so connected to the sector and has written on it academically and otherwise uh, has a real vision for what's going on. I think there needs to be a strong advocacy to develop this industry plan through that process of developing a, um, a, a, that he's, he's already instigated. And just to emphasise that again, if I may, that advocacy needing to be very connected and collective. One of the things I think we really are challenged across this sector, however you define it, is our disparateness. And we spend a long time being separated into a whole range of nooks and crannies and corners. And we even will assume from time to time a competitive uh, element that actually doesn't exist in its uh, general perception. I think there are competitive forces, but they generally are not from within, they're from without. So I think that we do have to lift our thinking. And you know, part of that, for example, and I see Wendy referencing again, another comment on, 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 yes, uh, around the doubling giving by 2023. You know, a question there for us that is a collective response is in order to double giving, I would suggest we have to be very clear about the purposes that we are serving from a social perspective, but we also need to improve the way in which we ask and engage those who give. We can't expect a double giving by osmosis. So the lifting there has to be something that we attend to and we create a more representative experience. Can I, can I add something around, because um, the first thing that pops into my head, and it, we may have covered it off a, a little earlier, but is the, you know, is this support for cyber security and, you know, our, the tech that we're investing in, is that going to be perceived as overhead and admin for all these not-for-profits? And is that then, you know, is that part of the reason why there's a hesitation around investing in it because the more you invest in this the higher your overheads are and as we know and I can't believe we're still having this conversation we'll probably never stop having this conversation is that it's very very bad for charities to have overheads um, and if you're going to put pressure on charities to not have you know to keep them low then it's things like this the unintended consequence I think is things like this get pushed to the side. So look, it's a, you're spot on, Charlotte. To me, it's a real soapbox issue because we sit around wondering about overheads. We don't ask Commonwealth Bank to reduce their overheads. We want them to be as, as uh, efficient and effective as they can be. And part of that is the administrative process. But it extends not just from overheads, but to things like audit. You know, I want to give all my money to this organisation. I want an audit, but I don't want any money spent on administration. It's just insane. Um, to me, this is uh, the fundamental issue where we're looking at these kinds of discussions rather than engaging in discussions about whether or not the organisations are effect effective. That's the, the key. So, look, I, I agree. I think we, we need to advocate to change the culture around that discussion. And the reason we are often wringing our hands around digital transformation and uh, understanding cost base and uh, engaging people in giving is because we have had this completely constrictive approach towards overhead because we really haven't sought to challenge the paradigm around that. And you know, that, that one I'm going to really push hard to lay at the feet of governance and of, of board members here because I I hear this in market where people will nominate a figure, insert whatever number you like, and say, well, this is the number we should reach. And there's no evidence for this. There's no basis. And all that does is stop us from serving purpose and stop us from engaging donors. And that is completely the opposite of why we exist. So there is a stiff challenge. And you know, to Carly's question, 
know, how do we shift this? We have to educate from within our organisations and be far more strident in terms of how we do that and connect across the sector more completely. And, and yes, Dan Pilotta's film Uncharable is, is important, and Dan Pilotta's message is, is important, but you know, there are people like um, David and like Miles and Wendy in Australia and other people like Adrian Sargent have been talking about this for decades as well. So it's probably high time to listen. That, that's a good point. Um, sorry, you go, Craig. Oh, no, I was just going to add a, a comment from Maggie saying many NGOs work with the volunteers and, and don't have any overhead and extra tasks would actually burden the already stretched volunteering team as well. That's true. I, I'd also uh, add on to Charlotte's comments earlier around some of the organisations that we've worked with and we have discussions with. They've received grant funding to go and procure software, so enterprise kind of level software. They get it installed and then they have no idea how to use it. So, you know, there's $20,000, $50,000 or more that's kind of just gone down the drain because it's too complex. The staff, they either don't have capacity or they don't have the expertise on how to actually operate the technology. Um, was or there... you very generously get given another, you know, another, here's another database that you can use for our specific reporting and then next minute <laughs> you're trying to run five or six different databases and there's data points everywhere and you don't, yeah, it's just, it gets out of control, especially <laughs> when you've got a small team. Exactly. Um, were, were there any other specific areas uh, that any of our panelists would like to dive deeper into uh, that we think is worthwhile having more of a deeper panel discussion about or we'll move straight sure. into recommendations? Josh, I, I've just got one more comment to make, if I might. I think we, uh, we've had, just had a great discussion around aspects that impact the sector and the sector's possible responses and, and so on, which is all, I think, really useful. I think, though, the other big um, elephant in the room, if you like, is the lack of capacity in government to be able to understand both what's going on in the sector, but to also to understand and appreciate both the economics and the methodology of um, procuring the services that the sector provides, particularly in human services. So I think the other branch of this um, question is answered by how much investment's actually undertaken within government. So to Charlotte's comments around um, co uh, information requirements and what funders want and so on, um, this is a big issue because you might have a change in policy at the policy level in a government department, but at the procurement level, it never reaches there and they don't know how to procure under that policy arrangement. And so we go back to um, the same sorts of issues that we've had all along. So I think there is a real need, not just for investment in the sector, but investment in government so that government understands what it is they're doing as well. I think yeah. endorse that as well. And I think perhaps there's a, a call here from government to see the sector as a partner in a true sense rather than just a contractor to deliver services. And that you know, may seem a subtle shift or not, but I think it's very critical. The other thing I just quickly want to add, and particularly looking at the question of responsible ability for digital transformation, one of the questions that really continues to cycle back in my observation is this notion that organisations that serve a social purpose are primarily serving a longitudinal challenge or meeting a longitudinal challenge. That is, most social purposes that exist are long-term in their addressing or resolution. But I also see many business models that are framed to serve that long-term social purpose as being short-term. So a question, if your business model is short-term, both in service delivery and funding, and you're existing to serve a long-term purpose, there is a fundamental mismatch in how you operate that's never going to resolve itself. So you've got to be thinking longitudinally about how you actually operate and fund yourself to deliver the services that you exist to provide to market. Yep, very good points. Uh, just seeing another. And I was just going to jump in quickly and uh, mention, I know Nigel spoke to this comment previously, but Gabrielle uh, just made a mention to look out for Dan Pilota's film, Uncharitable, uh, which a lot of us are probably all familiar with, but. Uh, it, it looks to challenge the notion that overheads equal efficiency, which I think has been uh, explained with all our panelists. And, and 
brand to uh, changing the perception of the word overhead uh, requires a change in our language. So we, yeah, just mentioning we need to become smarter with our communication around that terminology. And I can probably just to, just quickly to, to reference the, you know, my comment around Dan's work. Now Dan, Dan has a great message; he's been giving that for over a decade now. So uh, this is not a new message; it's just a different mm -hmm. medium that he's pursuing. But you know, I think that um, this message is amplified from an academic base as well, which gives us really strong evidentiary position around why uh, this sort of overhead conversation is completely flawed. So I think there's that. You know, if we look back to uh, it was a decade ago, I think, the three major charity watchdogs actually wrote a letter to the American public saying we were wrong about the overhead myth. So, you know, we're a little slow to the party to still be having this conversation decade after decade when we continue to see Rome burning in terms of services not being attended to and donors not being engaged well. So, you know, I'm quite passionate about this. Uh, I'm sure I'm not alone, but uh, yep, yeah, whoever sends the message, get on board and amplify it. Mm -hmm. Certainly. And we have another question here from Akash. Uh, I'm curious about the crypto giving and the trends observed in the report. Do you believe that blockchain technology could potentially provide a solution for issues like data management and to a greater extent, cyber, cyber security threats? Despite the hesitancy and resource constraints, do you think it's worthwhile to engage in discussions about implementing such technological solutions? This is a uh, very different topic to what we've been discussing, but I think one that uh, the SOT report went into. So Josh, I, you wanna to, kick I'm that happy off? to kick that, kick that one off if you like. So uh, from our perspective, yes, we see that there is a lot of benefits that blockchain can bring to the sector. However, the sector are barely on web two yet, a lot of the sector. So uh, barely digital at all. So expecting a lot of the sector to move into those emerging Web3 technologies is, I think is a pretty big ask. Some of the larger organizations, yes. Um, we've seen uh, some organizations try and implement it from a provenance point of view. So sustainable fish supplies and things like that. But at the end of the day, my personal opinion is that that won't fix the problem because it's too easily, too easy to commit fraud in supply chain of fish, for instance, or, or goods for provenance on blockchain. Uh, we've done some work around the establishment of nonprofits. So the setting up using blockchain, smart contracts, and what they refer to as DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations to fund the initial uh, operations of a of a nonprofit, so it may be a group of people come together and contribute X amount of dollars to kick it off. Um, they in turn could receive voting tokens, where they can that represents you know they can vote board members of the organization, or you know vote in certain roles of the organization, uh, set up grants and manage the release and facilitation of grants using all of this technology. Uh, cross-water payments is another big one. And then uh, payments into the unbanked and underbanked. So almost direct to recipient payments, uh, which usually would be outside of Australia. They're the areas that we see a huge potential, but from a sector as a whole, I think it still needs a hand up into standard digital transformation before moving into the more emerging tech. Did any of the other panelists have any thoughts or? Just a, a quick observation. And you know, this is certainly an area that I won't claim great expertise in, but an observation generally, whether it's about uh, giving or the other technological applications, is there's a tendency to look at these things as a, as a panacea, as a delivery point. They're an instrument, they're a tool, they're a mechanism to provide a conduit um, and need to be seen as such. So again, this comes back to being a resource, not a, um, a mechanism for, uh, for money, for an as an example. So I think we just have to be careful that we don't sort of 
flock to the side of the boat where the next new thing is happening, but we just have a really clear and deliberate understanding of why any um, uh, technology or other media may be useful in us serving our purpose. Yep. I think there was one more question or that's already been answered now from. Um, it looks there was like one that. question that was um, directed at David, but he's, uh, he's answered it in the, in the comments there. So I think we're fine for that. Great. Um, is there, I just put a open invitation out to anyone still in the chat, if they'd like to ask a question now before we move on to recommendations. Don't see any coming through, but we can circle back on that uh, after the recommendations if there are any coming through. Great. So from from our perspective, a couple of areas that uh, we're recommending for different stakeholders of the sector. So obviously for nonprofit sector leaders, board members, team, etc. Actually having a bit of a look into or auditing your existing digital operations and tools. So from 25% of participants saying that they don't store any data, I think maybe taking a bit deeper look on what you actually do store, how you're storing it, whether there's uh, you know, previous team members or volunteers that still have access to software or email accounts or payment systems, whatever that may be. Um, and then investing in training and support. If, if you're a smaller organization and you have financial constraints, obviously time. So allocating some time, uh, we'll be happy to circle some resources after this talk around where you can find free training materials. Um, did our panelists have any other recommendations that they'd like to to add for non specifically non profit sector leaders and board members and so on? Um, Justice Connect has some cybersecurity resources if you Google. Um, Cybersecurity Justice Connect, the not-for-profit law centre, has some has some resources there, checklists that you can go through. That's a that's a good start. Yep, I'll I'll uh, look for those links now and, and drop them into the comments. I think I've got that here. And so. The next would be for donors, philanthropists and foundations. So I think we've kind of touched on this from our panelists as well. So really supporting the organizations that are undergoing digital transformation. So as a whole, the sector seems to be lacking in this area. Um, and as mentioned previously, the government's taking an approach of, it doesn't matter if you're a nonprofit or not, you'll still be, you know, falling under these new regulations around data privacy and so on. And obviously, as we've seen with um, recent cyber breaches, just because you're doing good deeds and you're in the nonprofit sector doesn't mean that you're not a target for cyber criminals. Um, so really, you know, providing what it takes, I think, and whether that's funding, whether that's free training, whether you have products or services that you can offer you know, for as a grant or, or so on. Uh, and then really encouraging organizations to embrace and, and use these digital solutions. Um, an example of that would be, uh, I was at a meeting the other day and I, I had somebody that I was with ask for a paper direct debit donations form. Um, you know, if you're planning on making donations and so on, try to encourage the organizations, I guess, to use secure methods rather than some of these methods that your data may end up, you know, falling through the cracks and your personal details or your, your banking details and so on could just be out in the wild. Did our panelists have any other recommendations for donors, philanthropists, foundations? Um, well, so I guess the only one that I think we should be taking into consideration is, as, as you're, uh, I'm sure everyone's aware, the government's objective is to double philanthropy, um, which is a, a, a laudable objective. I guess my concern is that the sector needs to ensure that the result of doubling philanthropy is not going to actually result in reduced 
uh, funding to programs that are that are funded specifically by the Commonwealth government. Uh, especially given that if we, uh, so my uh, calculations on the back of an envelope, literally on the back of an envelope, uh, were that in um, 2021, I think about 13.4 billion was donated to charities in Australia reported by the ACNC. If we double that, of course, that's $26.8 billion. If you said somewhere around the, the tax deduction that accrues to that is, to my mind, something around 9.6 billion. So I'd like to know what the uh, plan is to be able to uh, manage that hole in the um, the government's revenue to ensure that the sector is not going to bear the burden of that um, that significant gap in um, in taxation. So I, this, it's slightly down in the weeds in one sense, but I do think it is a macro issue that the sector doesn't tend to think about in the context of doubling philanthropy. Uh, and I think we need to be across that and getting some um, awareness in government so that we know where that um, that money is going to come from the budget. That's a really good point. And David, this sort of picks up this partnership question versus exactly. the question, I think, again as well. And I think the big point, once again, the call on the sector and those organisations and leaders who populate it to be far more um, uh, strident in their advocacy, but also yep. to be connected. So we are actually saying the same thing as largely as you might. Agreed. Um, that power and collective action. Because you're right, I mean, there's no point in doubling philanthropy if you see a dissipation of other funding. Uh, we don't actually make any advances in serving purpose, which is why we would be doing this. So absolutely. I think that, and uh, a, absolutely. And it's a material tax deduction. It's not, um, you know, just uh, mice. It's, it's serious. Yeah. And again, it sort of negates that uh, notion of actually encouraging giving through taxation mechanisms by then um, you know, doing something so efficient to another one as well. So, but yeah. just another quick comment, if I might, and probably harking back to the question of um, your earlier recommendations around training and audit. You know, I think that the encouragement to organisations to look at themselves from outside in is certainly something to you know, perhaps raise a view on and um, uh, that's potentially self-serving is what I do but that's only in the part of that landscape um, but I think the you know, the challenge is, is who and how um, you might attend to those processes and the training question is a huge one in the sector and again you know, we've assembled a sector from a host of different backgrounds and pathways and to assume there are common bodies of knowledge around a host of issues that we actually prosecute, I think is a massive leap of assumption. So what training is necessary across all levels of activity from uh, you know, core function right through to governance leadership are critical questions to attend to. So you know, that moving to the questions on the recommendations on the screen now about supporting organisations in digital transformation and other work um, to attend to some of these bigger questions about development do again represent questions to be had with funders about how we you know, raise the stakes of our capability as well as our capacity. Uh, Definitely. I think 100% agree with that. And it probably ties back into, we might have skipped a little bit ahead from recommendations for the government and uh, the Blueprint Expert Reference Group. Uh, so I think we may have a bit of a consensus as well, but developing that digital capabilities plan over a longer period of time. So what does that look like? I know that we assist a lot of small, smaller to medium organizations and uh, what that may look like for them could be very different to some of the larger guys. Uh, again, providing training and support and funding to nonprofits. So to actually execute this, if you want to double philanthropic giving, if that's the plan, and then you're also going to put a contingency in there that, well, you know, these organizations need to adhere by these new regulations or the board members are potentially liable. What does that look like? Is there a potential mass exodus of directors and board members who see the risk too great to want to warrant the actually being a part of the organization? Um, and then also engaging with the nonprofit industries tech kind of experts i would say so uh it would be very different to go to in our experience working in the sector for six seven years now compared to the normal tech sector it's it's very different to navigate 
um, going to just technology providers who don't understand the industry, I think would be uh, a, a bit of a fail or you're, you're setting yourself up for failure, um, which we've kind of seen with some other tech projects that the government's tried to execute, uh, I think around census and so on. But are there any other recommendations that our panelists would like to add in there? I have a recommendation. Yep. <laughs> Check your backup of your, of your databases. A friend um, of a friend of mine. <laughs> Um, realized that their they assumed that their database was being backed up and it wasn't. So if I have one recommendation, whoever whatever your CRM is, talk to your IT people and talk to your CRM and ask them the frequency and yeah, how much of your data is actually getting backed up because that could be a massive liability. <laughs> going back to our initial question. So Very you just have in. a look into it. <laughs> Not to be afraid to ask questions, you know, Charlotte's friend yeah. of a friend. Um, you know, I think that those experiences or experiences are really quite common. Sometimes we're afraid to uh, you know, identify them less we be seen as being um, you know, less than we are. But I think for every one of us that have worked in organisations across this sector, there have been those moments of truth that we face from time to time. So um, how do we actually think about uh, uh, those questions and actually uh, take uh, take on um, this with a, um, accepting we, we're gonna miss things, we're gonna make mistakes and all that will be true. The other thing I just wanna quickly add to that is is the communion with risk. I observe, again, fairly or unfairly, that at times, particularly at governance level, we will have a very um, uh, constrained communion with risk. That is, we go very risk defensive and we sort of turn into ourselves rather than actually accepting that risk is everywhere in everything that we do. So to have a proactive and uh, um, forward-facing view of how we prosecute risk is being a really critical challenge. So rather than being afraid of risk, to take it on, understand it, and prosecute the work that we do, knowing full well how we're navigating those risks. Great input. Um, David, anything from your side or any, I guess we can kind of move to any final comments. I think we're, we're pushing our hard stop at 12.30 here, so. Yeah. Uh, if uh, look, I, I need to say, Josh, thank you again. And it's been fantastic listening to Nigel and Charlotte's comments, as well as seeing the questions coming out of the uh, audience too. So appreciate being able to be involved and well done on the report. Thank you and appreciate you all for coming. I'm sure our audience and any of the future viewers online will get a lot of value out of it. Thanks again for the opportunity to include us in this conversation, Josh. It's uh, always enjoyable to uh, um, participate in these sort of discussions. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. And thanks again, Charlotte. Um, if I don't see any other questions coming in, I'm seeing a lot of people giving their thanks and, um, and so on. So I think, Without further ado, we'll wrap it up there. If no one has any other final comments I'd like to add. And after this, we'll send out a, um, an email to all the participants and panelists with a link to the full report uh, and a link to the video as well. Great. Thank you all again for, for attending and thanks for volunteering your time. Guys, appreciate it and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks very much. All the best. Thanks, Cheers. everybody. Take Bye. care.